reptiles really are not stupid. The general consensus amongst both reptile hobbyists and the general public is that reptiles are quite slow and dim-witted. Many people seem to pass across the opinion that reptiles respond to stimuli from the environment in very limited and predictable ways in a sort of machine-like fashion. Now to illustrate what I mean by this, I actually have a book, uh, it's called Cold Blood by Richard Kerridge. Um, I actually got this for Christmas and it's actually a decent book to be honest, so if you want to read it I'll chuck a link down in the description to where you can get it. Um, but throughout this there is like peppered a couple of paragraphs that do display what I mean about people's mindset with reptiles and their intelligence. So make sure you're sitting comfortably because I'm going to put on my best reading voice and read out a little bit of this and you should get what I'm on about. <clears throat> Striking is a reflex. Certain signals prime the snake's body to strike and then trigger the strike itself. They are various. Snakes are highly alert to movements above them and, depending on how near and how high the movement is, swooping birds are a constant danger, they will whisk away into the grass or contract into a coil, the launch pad for a strike. Body secretions in the air have the same effect. Snakes are very sensitive to these. Caught on the tongue and tasted in the mouth, these chemical traces tell the snake that prey or danger is near. Imagine the tingling of your own tongue much stronger. If the taste is prey, the snake will investigate. If the prey is approaching, the snake readies itself in ambush. An alarming taste makes it flee or coil defensively. Ground vibrations are messages too. A snake has no external ear, but vibrations felt by the underside of the jaw are communicated to the inner ear, and vibrations also register on the skin. And this is the important sentence. The snake's organs are always making that calculation, flight or strike, and the snake just does. Now I'm going to stop reading out any more of this book because like I've got no rights to it so I'll probably get shot by somebody if I keep reading it out. Uh, so that's that. But I think it should sort of get the point across that even for people who, like Richard Kerridge, are into their reptiles, there is a general misconception that reptiles are just like machines and they don't really have any sort of consciousness. Now I would argue that any animal, to an extent humans included, does respond in a very mechanical manner to stimuli from the environment, but I don't think that it is the right way to go about things to think of all animals as just being simple computing devices that take in inputs and send particular outputs to deal with those inputs which are environmental stimuli. But how do we go about testing this form of intelligence through different animals? Because everybody thinks that human beings are the most intelligent species on Earth, when people see animals performing behaviours that are at least reminiscent to human behaviours, we tend to get the impression that those animals are more intelligent than others. So for example, whenever people come round like the house and look at my reptiles, somebody actually usually will make the remark that Char the Bearded Dragon looks intelligent that he looks like he's thinking things. Because when he's sat there, like, you know, he looks about, doesn't he? He sort of eyes things up, twitches his head. He looks like he's turned on versus, say, some of me leopard geckos. They just seem to be sleeping and then people draw the conclusion that they aren't as intelligent. The question there is then, are they actually less intelligent? Or do we just class them as being less intelligent because the way that they move and the way that they are awake during the day and so on? is less like what a human would do. I think as well that the way people sort of judge intelligence is based on animals having visual systems that are similar to our own and therefore they can be intelligent in the same way as us. So what I sort of mean by this is generally when people are testing intelligence they go for visual tests, say recognising colours or recognising shapes or doing things like that but for an animal like a snake, which is primarily scent driven rather than, you know, visually driven, how can we actually be really testing their intelligence if we are not going for their main sense? So what I'm getting at with all of this is that I personally would argue that lots of ideas about reptiles being unintelligent stem from the fact that they perceive their world in a much different way to us and therefore the things that we look for to, like, class as intelligence 
are never going to be there with those animals because the way that they are intelligent is so abstract from what we are used to. Now, to that sort of end, we tend to also think that reptiles are completely emotionless, that they just the things that they respond to are just very simplistic, like for example, is the food, should I eat it? Is the danger, should I run away from it? They're all very simple things and it does sort of create an impression of being quite robotic. Um, and you know, people go on about them not having emotions and I would have agreed with all of this a couple of years ago. But having kept reptiles myself for a large amount of time is what has made me think of all these things and start to question what I previously thought. Now in terms of my own reptile keeping experiences, there have been quite a number of things over the years that have made me think of reptiles as being a lot more intelligent than I used to. So the first one of these things that I did bump into quite early in keeping reptiles is them actually learning to recognise when food is coming because actually all of my reptiles do to some degree know when I am about to feed them, including me snakes, for example red and corn snake you'll have seen in different feeding videos I've done, he actually recognises the sound of his like feeding tongs clanging together as being a sort of, you know, it's going to occur, he's going to hear that sound before he gets fed. It might seem a little bit unusual to be honest that a snake has recognised the sound because they aren't supposed to have the best hearing um, and it's definitely unusual as well because I never trained him to do this it was just the way I used to keep him I kept his feeding tongs underneath his vivarium so when I was gonna feed him and I lifted him up I would accidentally knock him on something and he just learnt that of his own accord Another bit of intelligence that did actually catch me off guard was with my line day geckos. So these have had them for very nearly a year now, um, the first two that I got, and I had sort of always assumed that day geckos would be a bit like fish, in that you chuck them in, a, in their enclosure and then they just get on with it and don't interact with you. But certainly the way that they behave is so complex, especially as they are so small. They're like a couple of inches long, max, including the tail. Um, but they, when you walk past the enclosure, they do look at you. They look back and they sort of watch what you're doing. Which I suppose, again, there is the danger of the sort of anthropomorphism side of intelligence where because they are an animal that relies on their visual system to get about in the world, which is like what we do, we tend to see that as being more of a sign of intelligence, but whether it is or not, you get the point. Um, but apart from this, the way that they interact with each other is really complex. Um, I've got a few clips that hopefully I'll be showing you, um, where they've got all sorts of different mannerisms and ways of communicating with each other. So for example, head shaking is a sign of dominance, Tongue flicking is what they do as sort of submission, and they also do a bit of tail wagging as a sort of aggressive dominance posture. If these were totally stupid, why would they have mechanisms to get across their own sort of feelings to each other? I mean, I suppose that's strange with dangerous topics saying that they have feelings, but if an animal can feel aggressive towards another, then there's surely got to be something going on there, right? And of course, there is the biggie that's come up recently, and that is intelligence in the two new leopard geckos that I got just about a month ago. <sighs> now, to digress fully onto these leopard geckos, uh, I do want to say that I have kept leopard geckos for nearly six years now. Six years in a month after a film this, I got my first leopard gecko. And I was not expecting this display of intelligence at all. So what was actually going on is that, well, first off, a bit of background, these two leopard geckos are in a quarantine system, this is not their final viv, so don't worry about that. And then also, there are two of them, both females, yes they are living together, that's something I'll talk about again, and their names are Pepper and Dotty. Pepper being the Max Snow, who's a darker colour, and Dotty being a Hypo Max Snow and a much lighter colour. Now then, since I got them, Pepper was always quite active, quite unusually active for a leopard gecko, but, you know, I thought she was just settling in, so I wasn't too worried about it. But what she would do was, like, go around the enclosure and climb over everything, um, which was, you know, it was interesting to watch, and she was eating, so like I say, I wasn't worried. But there was one time that I went in to feed her, and instead of taking the food off me, 
she actually climbed on my hand and climbed out the enclosure. I was not at all ready for this because, you know, I hadn't handled them at all yet, so I wasn't expecting them to be tame in the slightest. Um, but she did, she just came up my arm, came out, came for a little mosey round, and then I popped her back and that was that until the next day because she actually clocked on to where I'd lifted her out the enclosure and came to the door to beg to be let out. And the next day she did the same and the next day after that and the next day after that and it seemed like in just one session of me taking her out on her own accord she had learnt that she could get out of the enclosure that way and repeatedly asked, you know, asked me to take her out. So in and of itself, I was quite shocked by that because, you know, nearly six years of keeping Lapa Geckos and I've never heard of anything like that at all. So that was really surprising, but it was what happened next that has sort of fueled me making this video. So the one that had been coming out this far, like I said, was Pepper, the Max Now. And of course, there was also a second leopard gecko in that enclosure, Dotty, the Hypo Max now. Now, what you should know about Dotty is that even today, she is much, much shyer than Pepper is. So she doesn't come out and climb round and all that. She just tends to stay in a hide. And if anybody comes past the enclosure, she sort of scuttles off. Um, from what I've found out, I actually don't think she has very good eyesight. She seems to miss quite a lot. But that is sort of besides the point. Um, really, just what I want to get across is that she's quite shy. Now, one of these days when I was taking Pepper out, where Pepper had asked me to come out by coming up to the door and scratching it, Dotty was peeping out the front of her hide and watching what Pepper was doing. Immediately after I took Pepper out the enclosure and Dotty had watched me do that, she actually came out of the hide in full view for the first time since I'd got her. And she came up to the same part of the enclosure and started to wait for me to take her out as well. And that for me was an absolute mind-blowing moment because just stop and think about what actually happened there. What Dottie did was watch a member of her own species do a particular action and copied it. When you think about that, that is that really does take some thought there has got to be some major intelligence going on there. And the bigger part of it was that every single day, just like Pepper since then, Dottie was coming up to the door and asking me to take her out the enclosure in just the same fashion as Pepper would. So she really had just caught on in a single fluke incident that she, if, you know, she'd watched what Pepper did imitated it and learned that she could repeat it to get the same result on a regular basis. So like I say, for me that was just an absolute mind-blowing moment because let me repeat that I have kept leopard geckos for almost six years and I have never heard of anything like that in the slightest. Here are both of the leopard geckos lining up to come out. Now before we go any further, I do want to discuss why the geckos might be asking me to take them out. Because usually people tend to think as well of reptiles not actually liking handling, that it's just sort of a human desire to want to hold them and therefore that they tolerate it rather than enjoy it. But in this case, if the geckos are asking to come out, then there surely must be a reason for that, right? Now, there were a couple of things that I thought of that could be the case, um, being that the enclosure is inadequate and they want to escape it to find new areas, um, that they are not enjoying each other's company because I am keeping several together, or that they simply enjoy the process of being handled. Now referring to each of these um, in terms of the enclosure being appropriately set up, well I don't think that's the case that it's like it's not appropriately set up because like I say keeping Lapa geckos for six years and I kind of know what I'm doing with that. Then the next point in terms of them not liking each other's company, well that certainly could be the case. Um, you know, I haven't actually kept leopard geckos together before this, so maybe they do want to escape each other. But again, neither of them fight at all, I've never seen them fight. They do sleep together, they are all feeding fine. So I sort of doubt that and that just leaves the final thing that they enjoy coming out to be held for some reason. But then that leaves another question of, 
if my geckos like to become like like to become but then that leaves the question of if my geckos want to come out to be held why don't everybody else's geckos want to come out to be held and in answer to that the only thing i can think of is that even for me keeping geckos in the past when they've been taken out of their enclosure it has been on my terms i've gone in at some point woken them up pick them up out of their enclosure and then help them. In this situation what's happened is that the geckos have asked me to come out on their terms. I think I've got to have some valid point in saying that perhaps it's the case that leopard geckos don't want to come out or just you know that reptiles in general don't want to be held because we are making them do that against their will and if we were to just step back and let them come out as their own choice then perhaps reptiles actually would enjoy handling. Now I don't know about you, but spontaneously learning things that bring things you like, i.e. learning to recognise when food is coming, then also having communication behaviours to express feelings in a sense, to conspecifics, and then also being able to learn from individuals of your own species to get something that you like, those don't sound like things that machines do. So anyway guys, I'm not going to go on too much more about this whole reptile intelligence thing because most of the stuff that I've got to talk about is all sort of my own little ideas and different anecdotes and things. I don't, you know, I don't have any PhD thesis type things to go on at you about. But hopefully this video has opened your mind to the fact that reptiles really cannot be as stupid as most people think they are. So the main message that I want to leave you with at the end of this video is that reptiles are intelligent creatures. Perhaps we don't know how intelligent they are or perhaps it's very difficult to measure that intelligence. But we do know that there's something going on there and as a result of that I think that when we are looking at keeping reptiles, we should take that into consideration and not just treat them like objects, keeping them in boring, featureless enclosures that are not only not physically enriching, but not mentally enriching either. You know, we should take this idea of them being conscious creatures and not machines and hopefully use that to improve reptile husbandry across the board. But anyway, maybe they're the musings of a madman and this video was rubbish, but hopefully it wasn't and if you did enjoy it then you will subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss content that will be coming to you in the near future. But apart from that, if you do want to leave me with any comments of your own ideas about what you think about reptile intelligence, then make sure you do down below and I will have a look at them. But anyway, that is it for now. I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys!